Uh, what got you there with got you got you? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there uh, with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Dean Keith Simonton has devoted his career as a social psychologist investigating the origins of and evolution of genius, creativity, and leadership. He has researched the personal, social, cultural, developmental, and cognitive factors that contribute to greatness in the arts, the humanities, and especially the sciences. If you want to know what is common amongst many of the geniuses throughout history, then tune in to this episode. Hey guys, I want to tell you about the brand I'm obsessed with right now. And you guys know I'm pretty obsessive about the brands I work with, especially when it comes to athletic apparel. You guys need to check out 10,000. You need to head to 10,000.cc and you guys can enter code WGYT and you're going to receive 20%, yes, 20% off your entire order. Why do I love 10,000? 10,000 created the only training shorts you'll ever need. They do so by simplifying your options to deliver three premium shorts that perfectly cover all the ways you train. They have one built for versatility, another for durability, and one super lightweight, perfect for one of those runs or whatever else you do for fitness. No matter what you do, they have you covered. CrossFit, running, spin, yoga, lifting, or your weekend adventure, it doesn't matter what you do for fitness. They have a short for every way you train. They make it super simple too to find the right short. Just pick the short that's best for you, your lifestyle, personalize it with your individual needs with a custom liner and inseam options, and start getting after it. Not sure if they have the right short? No need to worry, you guys. Make a return or exchange. They offer free shipping, free exchanges, and free returns on every order. Like I said, 10,000 is my favorite brand right now. I am wearing their apparel all the time when I'm working out. I can't recommend them enough. Head to 10,000.cc, enter code WGYT, and you've got 20% off your entire order. You guys know how much I love travel. So I think you're really going to like this next brand. That brand is Globekick. Head to globekick.com, check out what they've got going on, and you can also enter code WGYT to receive 10% off. Globekick makes your travel dreams a reality. They make it easy to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable adventures. And you're wondering what some of those adventures are? How about a yoga retreat in Italy? Cage diving with great whites in South Africa? Or their most recent trip was dog sledding and chasing the Northern Lights. Yes, they saw the Northern Lights. I think you guys would love checking them out. So head to globekick.com, enter code WGYT, and you've got 10% off. Welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. This is fantastic. Your uh, your research, your work is something I've really been a fan of for a while. So this is going to be a fun conversation. And and we're going to get to you. I know the podcast is called What Got You There, but we, we need to hit on some of your work first. So what led you to studying genius originally? Well, it actually started when I was a little kid. And my family uh, in elementary school, at recommendation of my elementary school teacher, it was actually first grade, recommended that uh, they purchase the World Book Encyclopedia, and um, I wasn't ready to read it, but I was ready to flip through it. And the nice thing about the World Book Encyclopedia is, since it's designed for K through 12 kids, it has lots of pictures. And I noticed that there are a lot of uh, pictures or paintings or sculptures of these people who I didn't know who they were. Um, they were often very exotic looking. They might be in Roman togas. They, they might have beards, uh, fancy hairdos or whatever. Um, but over time, and particularly once I started reading this encyclopedia, I realized that most of the people who have their pictures and their own articles, uh, in the encyclopedia are people who are famous for doing something. Uh, they're either, you know, great artists or great scientists or they're uh, presidents of the United States, or they are uh, military geniuses or entrepreneurs. Uh, they're there because they, they're accomplishments. So I've always been very curious about how you get into an encyclopedia in the first place. And um, that really came into fruition when um, I became a, a psychology major, and I found out that uh, psychologists actually study things like genius and creativity and, and leadership. 
And so it seemed like a, t- uh, a topic that I could investigate. It just took me a while to figure out how to study all these uh, dead people because most of these people are deceased by now. And so I had to develop methods to uh, study them posthumously. Uh, and I wanted to study them posthumously because you don't really know for sure how the story is going to end until they finally pass away. Uh, that's when you finally know when, they have, when they've produced their last masterpiece. You know, there's a number of people like Copernicus who saw his, uh, you know, his, his single greatest work on his deathbed. So uh, that's where the curiosity arose, is how do you get yourself into a, an encyclopedia or a biographical dictionary or, or something like that? What do you have to do? And what kind of person are you? When the teacher first recommended you pick up an encyclopedia, was that to you specifically, or was that just to the entire class, saying this is a great thing for all of you guys to pick up? It was, it was a recommendation. She actually visited our house and um, had a, a conversation with my parents uh, saying that if they wanted me to do well in school, uh, she would highly recommend this resource because um, it's specifically designed for K-12 through kids. And um, my parents were receptive because um, we were a working class family. Uh, we didn't have any books in the home. My dad uh, was a high school dropout, uh, and he worked uh, at an assembly line job in the aerospace industry that he absolutely hated and wish he had gotten in a, at least a high school degree. So they were very receptive to the idea, to the recommendation of my teacher, that if I wanted to escape the working class, which obviously I eventually did, uh, I needed to have some kind of resources uh, in the home. I needed to have, I mean, like I said, we didn't even have books in the home at the time. So uh, this encyclopedia would provide a, a very exhaustive resource in case I wanted to look up anything for a, a, a paper or, or whatever. And later on, my younger sister used it too, but unfortunately, my younger sister would actually cut out pages <laughs> and paste them into papers. So uh, she basically destroyed it, but... Uh, <laughs> In any case. I mean, anyone who's familiar with the encyclopedia understands how expensive those books are. So what was it that your parents saw in you or just the understanding of that source material? It was so important for them to spend that amount of money for you to have access to this. Oh, yeah, they're very expensive. Um, uh, One of the things that was clear is that um, I was something of a precocious kid and I had a lot of interests. Uh, I would make mechanical things. I uh, would go out and uh, collect things. I set up um, terrariums and aquariums to uh, to, to uh, hold my collections. I found this really interesting, ugly creature once in a pond, and I put it in an aquarium to figure out uh, what it was. And uh, it finally came out as a dragonfly. You know, it metamorphosed and then uh, and then came out as a dragonfly. So my parents could see that I was, you know, someone who had a thirst for for knowledge and um, that this wouldn't just collect dust. And um, and it worked. I, I did very well in school. And of course, later on, I had to upgrade to uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, something more appropriate for uh, university level. But they they saw something. I was a very wide reader at a very, very young age. I just loved to read, uh, still love to read. Uh, uh, in fact, in high, in high school, I worked at a car wash, and I saved up my money, and I bought the what was called the Great Books of the Western World. I had all the, the uh, masterpieces of Western civilization from Homer to Freud. And... Um, so I think that's why they were willing to do the investment. And like I said, my dad hated his job, and he did not want me to follow in his footsteps at all. He wanted me to get a, a good education, and he had no idea I'd get a PhD from Harvard. Uh, so he got actually uh, more out of his investment than he anticipated. <laughs> you, you mentioned your high school purchase of the great books of the Western world. Something tells me you still own those, do you? Yeah, I still own them. Very cool. They're kind of they're, they're kind of falling apart. And in fact, I finally decided I couldn't read them anymore because the binding was falling apart. 
So I got them all on my Kindle. You know, I just went online and um, most of the great books of the Western world you can you can download for your Kindle. And most of them are actually free now as well. You know, they're they're uh, they're well beyond copyright. You know, so uh, yeah, I, 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 there actually was a ten year program, reading program for the great books, and I went through it all ten years. It took me. Uh, almost 40 years to do it, but I, I, I did finish it. How many books do you have on your Kindle currently? Um, actually, quite a few. It just so happens that yesterday I finished reading, so I just happened to have this up. Coincidentally, I uh, read um, Saxo Grammatics's um, History of the Danes. I finished that yesterday, and I have on my Kindle... 1,126 books. So, uh, quite a few. <laughs> quite, a few <laughs> quite a few indeed. Well, what percentage of that, of that total have you read? Oh, gee, um, let me see something here. Um, I've read about 10% of them all. This is, this is more than the great books. Uh, the, the first book, let's see, is um, by Baha'u'llah, the, the founder of the Baha'i Faith. And the last one is a collection of Japanese uh, fairy tales and then everything in between. Um, but uh, I've read probably around 10% so far. I'm obviously not going to finish it. Um, let's see the last book. Here we go. Uh, Ie uh, Ozaki's uh, Japanese fairy tales. I, I finished that one. I'm assuming you're going to hate this question, but if you could only keep three of those books on your Kindle to read forever, what would those three be? Oh, gee. Well, one of them obviously would be Shakespeare uh, because there's just so many plays to read. I'm, I, I'm, I've reread Shakespeare's plays a number of times. I'm, re I'm rereading them now. Um, and I'm now reading Assimiling. And um, so that would be number one. You said three? I'll give you three. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Whoa. Um, I think the next one would probably be, um, be Plato's Dialogues. I'm reading them now, and I just find them fascinating. And, you know, of course, it's, it's in a dialogue format, so it's almost like reading uh, drama. And then, gee, for the third one, oh, God, that's going to be really hard. Um, Probably uh, Darwin's Origin of Species. You mentioned my book, which was the title was modeled after Origin of Species. I called it Origins of Genius. And uh, so, um, you know, Darwin has had a major influence on me. And I have all of Darwin's uh, major writings, not just the Origin of Species, but all the other great books he wrote. So I'd probably pick those three off off the wall. I mean, I, uh, I might change my mind later on. but. Uh, that's a pretty reasonable collection. You have literature, philosophy, and science. That'll certainly keep you entertained. I'm interested, when you pick up a new book, what's your reading habit like? Are you highlighting? Are you taking notes? Are you always starting from the beginning? Do you ever not finish a book? I'm so fascinated by, by all of those elements that you encapsulate when you read. Well, when I first started reading, uh, when I started reading the great books, um. I, I was an extensive note taker, and um, and I would write in the margin. Um, if it was a book that I would read more than once, um, I would add notes to my notes. Um, it actually really irritated my wife because she says, you're destroying those books. You know, I, I have all sorts of markings and underlinings and what have you. And she says, what's the point in buying a, a complete set of these great books and and then mark them all up and um, and I said because sometimes I want to go back I want to go back and you know find a quote or you know find when this issue was discussed or whatever and um, so I used to do that all the time now when I start reading Kindle <clears throat> it's not as easy to t you you can take notes on a Kindle but it's not as easy and so um, I, I don't bother doing it anymore I only do it when I'm reading on, reading on paper. Uh, and of course, now as a scientist, a lot of my reading is, um, you know, scientific journal articles, and I read them on PDFs, and I can easily highlight PDFs. So, um, 
I've, I've kind of changed my reading habits uh, over time. But a lot of times, for really, really um, important books, um, I'd uh, f- first write marginal notes. And then when I go back to reread it, I would read the sections that I've highlighted as particularly important. And if I went back a third time, then I would read the highlighted, highlighted sections um, until I was focused on what I thought was the, the gist, you know, the most important ideas that this, uh, you know, this writer had for me to learn. Do you carry a notebook? I used to carry a notebook, um, but I don't anymore. Uh, I try to uh, store everything in my brain. Fortunately, what <clears throat> for me, I do all my work at home. So, um, you know, I have, I have multiple uh, uh, manuscripts opened up uh, on Word, and I'll be working on something, and then and I'll start on something else. I, I tend to be a multitasker, uh, and so I will often work on, you know, two or more things at the same time. And um, I don't like, you know, you reach a point when you're writing a lot, for example, and I've, you know, I've written a lot of journal articles and books and stuff. Uh, I don't like writer's block. And I found the best solution to writer's block is to start working on something else. And then you can just keep on going. Uh, now, sometimes you get a writer's block on everything you're working on. Uh, and then it's time to take the dog for a walk. Is that what you do? You head out for a long walk? Or a bike ride or, you know, some kind of a thing that just takes me away from uh, the computer. Uh, and then I can come back and usually I can start up again. Um, you know, writer's block usually doesn't last longer than a, than a walk or a bike ride. What's your office like? Uh, my office is kind of interesting. It's, uh, of course, it's got a lot of books in it. Uh, it also has my artwork, which is really um, strange stuff. It is um, uh, called uh, art boxes. Uh, there are containers with found objects in them. And uh, it's, it's sort of like, uh, there's an artist called uh, Joseph Cornell, and it's sort of like his work, but not quite. Um, and I didn't discover him until after uh, I started my own work. And uh, and I have a whole bunch of plaques, you know, my my Harvard degree and various teaching awards and research awards on the wall. It kind of encouraged me. That also helps when I have wider writer's block. I look at look at my wall and my plaques and whatever. And then, um, gee, what else? That's basically it. I mean, what else can you have besides books and art and what have you? I usually have music on all the time. I uh, obviously turned it off for the interview. I, I like listening to classical music. Well, thank you and, for turning uh, it off. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have very broad. I, I listen to a lot of classical, but I also have uh, interest in jazz and all sorts of other kinds of music as well. But uh, classical is my interest. And that, and that has to my research because I've published a lot of research on, on classical composers as well. The listeners are are nervous. I'm about to go down a deep rabbit hole with you in regards to wine because they know my obsession and fascination. I just got back from some wine tasting, but we'll save them right now. Maybe we'll bring okay. up we'll bring up wine later on because I do know that you used to own stock uh, in a vineyard. So I'd love to talk about that a little bit. But I'm so interested. You mentioned the amount you read. I would love to know throughout a normal day the amount of hours you spend reading, and then also what's your overall daily routine look like now. Well, of course, it's kind of uh, it's it's kind of not very representative because I'm retired, so uh, I uh, I can do whatever I want whenever I want to do it. So I I do a lot of reading in the morning, and um, uh, I actually subscribe to a number of uh, electronic newspapers like uh, the New York Times, for example. So I usually read the New York Times uh, in the morning when I have my first cup of coffee. Uh, and um, and then I start reading other things. I start reading uh, uh, like scientific journal articles, uh, particularly when I have um, reviews to do. I was uh, giving a, uh, given a manuscript to evaluate that was submitted for publication. And so I, I read that. And then, of course, I write the review. I haven't done that part yet. Um, and then I usually take a, t- a break in the late morning, 
uh, take the dog for a walk and um, do various kinds of chores and, and things like that. And then in the afternoon, I go back to to uh, reading. Uh, my reading on the Kindle is in the evening uh, before I go to bed. Uh, I, I like, uh, you know, just laying in bed and, and reading. I usually have uh, about a dozen books that I'm reading at any one time so that if I uh, get bored with one, it's sort of like uh, another version of a writer's block. If I get bored with one, um, the uh, I can move on to something else. And, and, you know, I have literature, I have science, I have philosophy. You know, I mentioned I'm, I'm reading the dialogues of, of uh, Plato, and I'm also reading the plays of Shakespeare again. And um, so I can just hop around. There's some books that I read that I can only read for a very, very short time. I can't even finish a chapter. Uh, and in fact, that uh, Saxo Grammaticus uh, History of the Danes was one of those because it's it's very bloody. It, it's, it's sort of like Game of Thrones. It's just, uh, you know, battles all over the place and, you know, people having their heads chopped off. And uh, I can only have so much of that, particularly before I go to bed. I don't want to have any Games of Thrones type nightmares uh, in the middle of the night. Has, has there been any book that's been published recently that you actually recommend? Books published recently? Um, you know, now I mostly read, uh, you know, nonfiction. And, um, and of course, a lot of it is in my field in psychology. So it's, it's somewhat, um, you know, technical or esoteric, not for the the general lay public. Um, probably the book I, I really, um, I'm trying to, th th oh God, I really have a hard time uh, picking any one book. Um, I like reading um, histories and biographies of modern times. I, I, I've read one book recently um, by a person who normally does auto, uh, does biography. In fact, he had a biography of Jobs. Walter Isaacson? And, yeah, exactly. And he did one on um, the history of um, the, the development of, of Silicon Valley. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, it was a very, very good book. Uh, he's, just a, he's just a really, really great writer. And what I like about him is he's very informative, too. He's just is, is chock full of facts. I ended up actually writing a, a review of this book. And... Um, I only could find one minor factual error in the whole darn thing. I mean, he's just, he obviously does his homework and is very thorough. And at the same time, he somehow manages to avoid being boring. You know, he doesn't get pedantic. So yeah, that's probably the book I read recently that I, you know, most enjoy and might recommend. Yeah, that's the second podcast in a row uh, Walter Isaacson has actually come up on. So he's got some great biographies. I love biographies. And, uh, yeah. Are, are there any other biographies you recommend? Uh, sorry, I'm so fascinated by, by what you read. And I, I'm basically purchasing a new book every day almost. And I'll, I'll, ne I'll, <laughs> never, I'll never get to 90% of them, much like yourself. But I'm, I'm fascinated by reading. I love it. It's a true passion of mine. Um, a lot of the biographies I read are associated with... Um, projects that I'm working on, okay? So, for example, I uh, did some research on Galileo Galilei and his uh, astronomical studies. And so I read every biography I could find about um, Galileo. And then I did another study on um, the patent history of um, Thomas Edison. And, um, and I read the best biographies of him as well. And so I'm, I'm kind of specialized in my, my reading. I, I, I tend, it tend to, tends to be focused on what I'm specifically doing. It used to be I'd read biographies, you know, left and right, uh, particularly of like my favorite classical composers, you know, like, uh, Thayer's life of Beethoven, things like that. But, uh, uh, now it, it tends to be pretty much focused unless I'm asked to do a book review. Um, and then, uh, and I almost always, when I get an invitation to do a book review, I almost always accept the invitation because my assumption is, is the editor asked me to review this book because he thought or she thought 
that I would have a particular interest in it and would have a perspective on it that would be useful to the the readers of the journal. And um, and they're almost always right, uh, you know. And at the same time, it broadens me because um, I, I often read books that I I wouldn't, if I went to a bookstore, pull off the shelf and and go to the cash register with, but I should uh, do that. And so it it uh, it broadens me. It's the same reason why almost every single time that a, a journal editor asks me to review a manuscript that's been submitted, I almost always accept the invitation because I'm assuming they can see a connection between what was submitted and my expertise. And uh, not only may I offer some perspective on it, but I actually may learn something from it. And so I find it a very rewarding thing. I've, I've done over a thousand evaluations of of submitted manuscripts and grant proposals and and book proposals and so forth. And uh, of course, a lot of the books I read also are uh, submitted books, submitted for publication. So, uh, and those are kind of fun because if they're published, then you, often what I wrote, my evaluation will, will be excerpted and become a blurb on the dust jacket. So uh, I get a little mini advertisement for my own pubs because of course you have to put you, what you've written at the bottom. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I love you, <laughs> I love your phrase, it broadens me. And yeah. I, I know that's a reoccurring theme throughout your life. So I'm going to put a post-it there and we're going to come back to that. But I have to ask about Thomas Edison and this will be my final reading question. So I live in, in Fort Myers, which he spent a lot of time in. We're, I'm about a half mile away from his uh, his estate home here and uh, the property I live on. Uh, his wife planted some of the original palm trees and mango trees. So I've, wow. been, I've been very excited to read some of his work. Anything that stood out about Edison to you? You mean to read? Correct. Probably the best thing to read is there's this really, really great website that's uh, specifically devoted to him. And it is overseen by one of the uh, world's leading experts on Edison. And what I think is amazing about this website is that is so complete, and it's not. It's not one of these things where, um, you know, it, it, it tries to idolize them because uh, there, are, you know, a lot of times websites are kind of devoted to hero worship. Um, Edison was not an entirely admirable person. Uh, there are a lot of negative sides, even as an inventor. I mean, there, he had absolutely catastrophic inventions. And one of my favorite things on this website is they actually. Um, you can click on links. You know, he has over a thousand patents. You can go on this website and you can click on each patent and get the original application come up in a PDF file. So you can actually see what he sent to the U.S. Patent Office. And um, some of these inventions are hilarious. Uh, he had this one invention for uh, an airplane. This is after the Wright brothers already had their successful uh, tests of, of their their plane. And uh, I guess he decided he wanted to get into the act. So he submitted a, a, a patent for a, a plane that consisted of um, four box kites uh, with strings attached to a rotating apparatus. And um, he obviously knew nothing about aerodynamics. You know, the Wright brothers did a lot of research before they could produce a heavier. It would, there's no way it would work. And it's amazing to me that the patent was even approved. Probably it was approved because at that stage, you know, practically anything Edison sent to the patent office got, you know, patent approval because he, uh, you know, by then was so famous. But it, it's, it was a ridiculous invention. And uh, you've probably seen all those photos of all those attempts to produce airplanes that were totally disastrous. Well, this makes those look good. <laughs> I'm I'm going to have to check this out. Are you, do you remember the website or even who is the publisher on the website so we can link that up? Well, I mean, I could I could send it to you. We can worry about that one later. Okay, all right. I, I want to dive more more into your work. So so let's start with. What are some of the various ways that you initially started to study genius? Okay, well, um, I mentioned before that when I was uh, an undergraduate and I decided to become a psychology major, 
I realized that psychologists actually study, did research on uh, genius and, and, and creativity and leadership. That's, those are the three words I use to describe what my work is about. And, um, but I didn't know exactly what methods I would need to, to study because the problem is, is even though psychologists study genius and creativity and leadership, uh, they don't actually study genius creators and leaders. They mostly study college students. Uh, and so what they'll do, like if they want to study genius uh, or, or, or maybe um, elementary school students or whatever, but in, in any case, they study more everyday people. So research on genius means primarily research on IQ. So for example, there's this classic study that was done in Stanford where they collected over 1,500 uh, kids, uh, boys and girls, who scored at least 140 on uh, an IQ test. And then they followed them all the way into adulthood to see if they uh, you know, became adult geniuses. Uh, and that's fine and dandy, and I, I have no problems with that. But I wanted to study the people who had the articles written about him in my Encyclopedia Britannica and, and World Book Encyclopedia. I wanted to study the geniuses like Michelangelo and Beethoven and Isaac Newton and so forth. And I couldn't really figure out a way of doing it. And it really came to a head when I was in graduate school. And I came across a number of studies that actually used famous creators, famous leaders, geniuses of various kinds that were in biographical dictionaries uh, and, and, you know, and even had whole biographies written about them, like, you know, Galileo and, and Thomas Edison. And um, so what I had to do is figure out a way to translate biographical data uh, into numbers. So, because I, I quantify things, I do statistical analyses, I, I fit mathematical models, uh, I do computer simulations, things like that. I'm, I'm not a psychobiographer. I, 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 I consider myself a scientist. And so I um, convert the biographical information and historical information into numbers that I can do data analyses on. Um, and I don't, it's not just... Um, it's not just biographical information, historical information. I also do uh, content analyses where I analyze the actual works that they produce. So, for example, I've done, and these are computer content analyses. So I program a computer to analyze the actual works of um, great composers. I've done computer analyses of Shakespeare's plays and of his um, sonnets. Uh, and um, I've done analyses of um, other kinds of literature. So um, I eventually get numbers, and then I um, analyze these numbers. And um, in the case of uh, uh, Thomas Edison, this website I mentioned earlier was ideal because I wanted to look at how what he worked on changed over time and um, and look at what projects he's working on were successful and um, what were failures. And they have a complete inventory of every single thing he patented. And, um, and then they already have it classified as to what area uh, specifically this particular project was devoted to. And it's actually astonishing uh, when you quantify this stuff, what kind of fascinating things you can find. You can, you know, like, I sh and I should point out, I, I don't, some of my stuff focuses on specific individuals. So I've done stuff specifically on Beethoven and in fact, specifically on his symphonies, uh, specifically on Edison, specifically on Galileo, uh, specifically on um, Napoleon, uh, specifically on King George III of England. Um, but other of my studies look at hundreds and even thousands of uh, individuals. So I've done a study of, of scientists that looked at over 2,000 eminent scientists, 2,026 uh, eminent scientists. Uh, I did a study of philosophers that looked at 2,012. 
So uh, I often use big databases. You know, they, now it's called big data, right? Uh, and that's the other thing I do. One of the, one of the things that's really changed the way I de- uh, conduct research is more and more information comes directly off the internet. I've done a lot of stuff on film, on uh, what films were uh, win film awards and um, do well in box office and uh, win critical acclaim. And almost all that information comes directly off the internet. Uh, it doesn't come from paper books, doesn't come from reference sources. Uh, it comes from like the internet movie database or Rotten Tomatoes or uh, you name it. And um, so it's become very easy to collect data and uh, quantify it. And then, of course, I have statistical software and, and mathematical software to then analyze those data. You mentioned three terms that encapsulate a lot of your work, creativity, genius, and leadership. I think it would be helpful. Can you define each one of those terms in your own words? Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, let me start with genius. There's actually two definitions uh, that you see in the dictionary. Uh, one is the standard psychological one that is used by most psychologists. And that is someone who has a high IQ. You know, you, you take a standardized IQ test and if you score 140 or above, then you're a genius. Some people set it lower. You know, if you want to get into Mensa, all you need is around 132, depending on the test. What's your IQ? I, I'm not going to say, <laughs> but let me, let me say, let me say I would satisfy the dictionary de- definition. There you go. <laughs> with, with some despair. Okay. No, I'm going to, I, I would have made it into that study I mentioned about Stanford kids. Okay. But um, uh, so that's one definition, but that's not the definition I like. I mean, even though I've published stuff on IQ definitions and stuff, and I've even figured out how to uh, estimate IQ in dead people. But um, my favorite definition of genius, and this is the one that ties in with um, leadership and creativity, is uh, someone who's made a unique and unprecedented contribution to world civilization. And you can see that definition fits both creators and leaders. The only difference is what domain they're contributing to. So, you know, you have political leaders who contribute to politics. You have military leaders who can contribute to the history of warfare. You have great scientists. You have great artists. You have great entrepreneurs. The main point is each of these individuals carved out a niche for themselves in history, in history books. They, one of my books is called Greatness, Who Makes History and Why? And so for me, um, the, the primary definition of genius is someone who's made history uh, either in as a creator or as a leader. Yeah, can we actually talk about that and about how the total lifetime productivity and how that provides the best behavioral indicator of creative genius in someone? Yeah, right, and, and creative genius. Um you know, sometimes people think that um, <clears throat> geniuses just sit back and come up with this great masterpiece and then they rest on their, their laurels for the rest of their life. Uh, maybe it'll take them a while. You know, like I mentioned, Copernicus didn't see his, uh, his masterpiece t- until he was on his deathbed. But um, the, the characteristic of creative genius is mass production. They, they, they produce and they produce and they produce and um, out of everything that they produce, they're fortunate that a handful of their creative ideas end up uh, making a name for them. That they end up, you know, shaking up the field or making a, a permanent change in, in technology or the way we live or maybe our religious beliefs or whatever. But um, most of what a great scientist or inventor or a com- composer produces it is really not that good. It, I mean, it, it's competent. It shows that they have expertise in a domain, but it's not going to be on the radio. Uh, it's not going to go through several editions. It's, it's not going to be something that is mentioned in the history books and the chronologies and so forth. So that productive, I, I, let me give you a, a, a Specific illustration, getting back to Thomas Edison, um, 
you know, he has over a thousand patents until the 21st century. He actually held a record for um, the most patents. Uh, but a lot of those patents were things for, for projects he's working on that never panned out. I'm not going to count the airplane because that he, he, he only did one thing on the airplane. And I, I really think he was just trying to get in on the, on the fashion of the day. Um, but he spent a huge amount of time trying to um, develop an economical way of extracting um, iron from poor grade ore that could be mined in the East Coast. And uh, he developed special um, ways of pulverizing the, the, uh, the ore and trying to extract the iron by using uh, super powerful magnets and so forth. It never worked. Uh, he had actually sold his interest in um, the uh, electric light bulb and the uh, and the electronic le electric delivery system, and that's what became General Electric, which is now in trouble. But that's another story. But um, he sold his interest in that and used that money on this project, and finally gave up. And his accountant told him. Guess what? You spent everything you earned on the electric light bulb. And he had nothing to show for it. Absolutely nothing to show for it. He worked on an electric car. A lot of people don't know this. You know, we, we have a Tesla, but we actually should have had an Edison. Hmm. He designed an electric car, but he could never get it to go very far before the batteries would go dead. It's, you know, it's a problem that he faced. Uh, he worked a lot on different kinds of batteries. Uh, one of the things he tried to do is develop a fuel cell that would um, convert electricity directly from the fuel by passing, you know, a, a boiler and a generator and all that kind of stuff. And he never succeeded in doing it. He never got a fuel cell to work. The, the, the closest he got is an, a major explosion that blew out all the windows on his laboratory. <laughs> so... So he had tremendous amount of failures, but guess what? He also had electric light bulb and uh, distribution system. He also had the phonograph. He also uh, invented a movie um, camera and started uh, the, the whole movie business. He he did the first feature length film, you know, the, the train robbery. Uh, he actually devised a really ingenious studio for uh, doing filming. Uh, he invented all sorts of, of, of crazy things that we still have with us today in some form or another. I mean, we even have phonographs. And maybe, a, you know, it's mostly the GJs use it, and you know, but uh, we still have phonographs. I still have an old phonograph. I mean, I haven't used it for a while, but I still have one. And he's the one that invented the phonograph. So he has a few successes that earn him a place in history. And that makes up for all the tremendous failures. And he still died a very wealthy man. So I, he may have lost all that money on, you know, on devising a way to generate, uh, to produce uh, iron from low quality ore, but uh, he still made a lot of money. So these people are constantly producing ideas and they're not always successful. And sometimes you, this can be a sad story because a lot of people don't realize you know, you think of Albert Einstein. Oh, wow. You know, he's 26, year old, you're 26 years old, and he comes up with, uh, you know, a special theory of relativity. Uh, in fact, it was, it was an Annus Mirabilis. And in, in, in one year, he published his paper on special theory of relativity, a paper on Brownian motion, and a, a paper on the photoelectric effect. It was actually the photoelectric effect paper that was cited when he got his Nobel tri uh, Prize. Uh, some years later. Um, so, I mean, really tremendous success. And then about a decade later, he came out with his um, general theory of relativity around 1916. Uh, uh, so far, so good. But guess what? He started working on uh, his unified field theory, spent three decades on it, and his unified field theory never worked. In fact, there was one version of it and he was told by uh, a colleague, you know, Einstein, this is not going to work because according to your theory, the universe wouldn't exist. 
And that's a problem. You know, that's one of those uh, empirical predictions that are easily falsifiable. I'd love to circle back to Einstein here in a minute, but I'm trying to view this through the the listener's lens right now. And if they're hoping to come up with some quote unquote genius ideas, is is the key then just the sheer amount of ideas you can produce in your lifetime? And throughout those, there's going to be a large number that are terrible ideas, but you might have those select few that are great. Yeah, and God, and you have to remember, a lot of times, those terrible ideas, those failures, are things that make your successes possible. Okay, you learn from them. You realize, okay, that's not going to work. I'm not going to be able to solve that equation. Um, I'm going to have to find an, another way to to solve this problem. So I, I, I say the same thing about, uh, you know, works not just at the individual level, but also at the level of, of the entire discipline. Uh, there are a lot of people, a lot of scientists who, who maybe produce one idea. They publish maybe one paper, like they maybe publish their doctor dissertation. Um, and that's it. And so in one respect, you consider them to be failures. But you never know, because sometimes a scientist will pick up on an idea that wasn't successful and figure out how to, how to make a success out of it. Um, Edison himself did that uh, with the light bulb. Um, people, he wasn't the first person to work on the light bulb. There were a lot of people working on the light bulb, but they were all taking the wrong approach. They were, uh, a lot of the light bulbs used like platinum filaments and they didn't last very long and they consumed lots of electricity. So that's not gonna work very well. Uh, and so he, he realized that the solution to uh, having a, a commercially viable electric light bulb is to um, find an inexpensive filament that have a high degree of electrical resistance and, and that would uh, glow very well. And, um, and so he spent over a thousand experiments looking for that filament. And you would never guess what he found he found that bamboo fibers, once they're carbonized, um, made excellent light bulb filaments. Now, who would guess a bamboo fiber? He wouldn't have been looking so far remote for a thing if he didn't see all these unsuccessful attempts uh, using wire. By the way, he actually thought of tungsten, but at the time, he couldn't make a good filament out of it. Of course, now most of our... Uh, incandescent bulbs use t uh, tungsten filaments. Of course, they're now disappearing left and right. But um, but the point is, um, failures can lead to successes. And um, sometimes, you know, a composer, they, they produce a symphony that just doesn't quite work, but their next symphony does. In fact, it's interesting. I, I've done uh, research on Beethoven, specifically focused on his symphonies. And, um, and I... Uh, I've used computer content analysis, so it's a very objective thing. And I've shown that, the, uh, the, just to kind of back up a little bit, uh, Beethoven's odd-numbered symphonies uh, tend to be much more successful than his even-numbered symphonies. You know, his third, fifth, seventh, and ninth in particular are considered to be his, his prime symphonies. Um, his even-numbered symphonies are not anywhere near as successful are not as frequently played and recorded. But the point is, is that he, he was still evolving. You can show that he was moving forward and he needed to go into his even-numbered symphonies. I, I call them almost like, um, you know, uh, springboards or whatever. He needed to back up a little bit, become a little bit more conservative, and then he would venture forward to another revolutionary idea in terms of symphonies. So it's not like you can just completely, if he, I would argue if he didn't do his even numbered symphonies, he wouldn't have been able to do his odd numbered symphonies. So it's another example of your failures helping out achieving successes. How important is it to receive inputs from fields um, that you're just unfamiliar with? It's extremely important. One of the number one characteristics of um, highly creative people, and by the way, this is also characteristic of um, great leaders as well, um, 
is that they tend to score very, very high on a personality trait called openness to experience. There's a there's something called the big five personality factors and um, that personality researchers have done lots of research on. And one of those factors is called openness to experience. And by openness to experience, we mean openness to almost anything. You, you like to read a lot of different things. Uh, you like to try out different foods. You like to travel to exotic places. Uh, you're open to um, different values, you know, different religions, different philosophies. You uh, are receptive to um, uh, emotions. You know, you're, you're, you are responsive. You're empathetic. Um, so that openness to just li- to life, what's out there. So what that means in the specific context of um, creative geniuses is that they, they'll have hobbies uh, that are often not particularly relevant. A lot of people know Albert Einstein, liked to play the violin, particularly like to play uh, Mozart violin sonatas. He also liked to go on his, on his sailboat. Um, most uh, great creators are very widely read. Uh, they will often have um, artistic hobbies. Uh, let me just cite one study that a, that a colleague of mine did. It was a very interesting one. He looked at scientists and stratified them into um, how successful they were. So the highest level of success were scientists who won a Nobel Prize. And then just below them are scientists who are um, elected to the National Academy of Sciences. These are all American scientists, uh, U.S. scientists. And then below them are just your, your, your regular, everyday scientists who publishes in good scientific journals, uh, you know, has a position at a research university. And then he looked at whether or not they had um, any artistic hobbies. What, what, did, what did they like to do for recreation? And um, he found that the higher the level of um, scientific achievement, the greater, the, the higher the probability that they had some kind of artistic avocation or a hobby. They may be interested in photo- photography or painting, or they like to read literature. Uh, and, and you see this often show up uh, in, incidentally, it's not deliberately, but it will show up in their actually, actual scientific contributions. Uh, one of the examples I like, I like to use has to do with um, Galileo. Um, because I, as I mentioned, I did a study on his astronomical discoveries. And one of the things that's very remarkable about um, his astronomical discoveries is that he would notice things that other people would completely overlook. He wasn't the first person to point a telescope at the moon. Other people had done that before him. But what others saw was a completely flat surface with some discoloration some lights and darks, and um, sort of like a marble. But it was a perfectly smooth surface. And of course, they were kind of led to that because Aristotle said that all heavenly bodies were, were perfectly smooth. They were perfect spheres. Well, Galileo pointed his telescope at the moon, and that's not what he saw. He saw mountains. Now, how did Galileo see, see mountains when other people just saw a perfectly smooth surface? Well, it turns out that Galileo loved to do art. He had a close friend who was a great uh, artist, and he had actual artistic training. And he particularly was uh, well trained in the technique of chiaroscuro, light and dark. How do you use shadows and uh, highlights to portray three-dimensional objects? Uh, And he knew how to do that. And so when he looked at um, the moon, he saw those light dark. He saw the lights at the top of mountains, and he saw the darks at the bottom of valleys. He he was actually able to identify a major crater um, based on these lights and darks, and he and then he actually drew it so people could see that these were mountains. In fact, those drawings he used were, were actually used in a, a painting that one of his friends did. Uh, the Madonna has her standing on the moon, but the moon has now got mountains on it instead of being a big oversized marble. 
So if he hadn't had the training in art, if he hadn't had the interest in art, when he turned his telescope to the moon, he probably just would have seen a smooth surface just like everybody else. I can't help but think, with you mentioning Einstein a minute ago and your talk just there about Galileo, imagination and, and the importance of this in the grand scheme of things. How important is imagination for someone like Einstein? Oh, it's extremely important. Um, you know, they, they, they talk about, well, this expression is overused, but, you know, they talk about thinking outside the box. But the, the ability to imagine things that other people wouldn't even think of. And, and this gets back to actually to the openness to experience because they find that um, openness experience is a correlated with, a, with an interesting cognitive quirk of highly creative people. And, and, and that is that they tend to have defocused attention. Uh, sometimes it's so defocused that they end up engaging in, in what's called mind wandering. So there's, they're just kind of, you know, kind of daydreaming and in some kind of reverie. And this allows their mind to go places that most people wouldn't go. You know, that, that allow them to conceive things that most people wouldn't conceive. And, of course, it particularly helps if you have a really good um, visual imagery. Not, not every great scientist has, um, you know, great visual imagery. But if you can imagine alternative worlds. So Einstein was, was famous at this. He, he would do the, what, the, what he called Gedanken experiments, thought experiments, where he would imagine... What would it be like if um, he turned on a flashlight and instead of staying where the, where the flashlight was, he'd follow the light beam? Uh, obviously, he'd have to go at the speed of light to do that. What would he see? Would he still see light waves if he was going at the speed of light? Or would he see a standing wave? And that led him to the special theory of relativity. Because in the special relativity uh, theory of relativity, you can't do that. That no matter how fast you go, light always goes at the speed of light faster than what you're doing. And then he worked out the implications of that. And you end up with all these bizarre things where you know, uh, clocks can slow down when they're accelerated. Uh, masses increase under acceleration. So he was able to imagine a situation that, that couldn't even happen. And he did the same thing for a general theory of relativity. He imagined himself in a box and imagined two alternative, imagine himself in a box that was falling and, you know, towards Earth or towards some gravitational object and asked himself, is there any way to determine whether or not he is falling or whether or not he's just out in outer space, where there's no gravitation at all? And he realized that there was no way of discriminating between the two. And by the same token, if he's in that box and the box is on the on the on the ground and he's and he's conducting various experiments, and he can say, oh, there's a gravitational pull. But if he's in outer space and that box is accelerated at G, the acceleration of gravity, um, could he tell the difference between the two? And he says, No, I can't tell the difference between the two. That inertial mass and gravitational mass are basically equivalent. Now, of course, he, he, he couldn't actually do that experiment. You know, he could put himself in a box out in the middle of outer space. But the point is, is that he was able to imagine that and then work out the implications. And of course, that, that's where the mathematics comes in. He, he, he made a point this one time. He was uh, interviewed about his working techniques. And he says, the math doesn't come to later. At first, work it all out in terms of imagery and uh, what I think is happening, and then I do the math. I don't derive it, my ideas from the math. I'm so fascinated by that. Something I would love to ask you is, what's something that you imagine that other people wouldn't think of? Oh boy, something that I would imagine that other people wouldn't think of. Um, I don't, I don't know. Most of my imagination, quite frankly, are um, Walter Mitty. Do you know who Walter Mitty is? I do not. Okay. Uh, Walter Mitty 
was a uh, fictional character, um, or was it the author? I'm trying to remember. I, I haven't read it in 30 or 40 years, but he was someone who always had fantasies about things. And his fantasies were, he had a very boring life. And uh, I think he was like a clerk in some office. And so he always imagined himself doing, you know, like, I think superhero stuff or whatever. And then he would be shaken out of it, you know, by his boss or whatever. And most of my imagination things are are like that, where, um, you know, like when I was, I used to play the guitar. And, um, you know, I would have these fantasies about, you know, having, you know, the audience scream and yell and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, that never happened. Uh, <laughs> I was I was never good enough. I finally had to hang up on that guitar because I, I was just never, you know, I was I wasn't going to be a Clapton or anything like that or a Jimi Hendrix. I, I, there's just no way. So, uh, um, but I had the fantasies, and they're pretty vivid. You know, I'm up there with my guitar, and you know, and there's the audience out there, and they're all rocking away in the in the mosh pit, and you know, so that's the kind of fantasies that I tend to have. I'm I'm incredibly intrigued by this. So I just finished up a conversation with Nick Kakonis, who uh, who is one of the the original mega restaurant owners. He owns Alinea Group. Uh, he's also started another company called Talk. And when he is battling with a new great idea, he says he paces in his backyard, and everything plays out for him like a movie. And I, I come from a sports background, and prior to games, everything to me was a movie. I, I played everything in my head like a movie. And you talk about visualization and imagery. So what is it you do when you strike up a great idea? Um, m- most of my, my really great ideas either come from um, words. I'm both a verbal thinker and also a, a visualizer. And I use, bo- I use both of those. Uh, and also, sometimes it comes out of the mathematics. And you're just there's sometimes, and this is always cool when this happens, that you're just working out the implications of uh, something, as um, a mathematical equation, and something really beautiful comes out, and uh, and then you can visualize it. Uh, you visualize it usually in the form of a curve. Uh, but uh, and there's other times where um, I have the visualization. And I, I know what I'm trying to get. And then I'm tr- trying to figure out how to translate that, what, what I'm seeing in my mind, uh, into um, an equation or at least some kind of uh, verbal uh, proposition or, or logic. Um, let me ju- just give you an example. Um, when, when, when I visualize the creative process, um, I, I know that the creative individual is trying to go a place where he or she has never been before. I mean, you just give it an example. You know, you're trying to you're trying to solve a problem that you can't solve just using your expertise. I mean, if you use your expertise, that's great. You solve it that way. You use an algorithm or whatever, or some particular domain specific technique or whatever. Um, but then you're not being creative. Uh, creativity involves venturing into the dark, venturing into places where um, no one else has gone before. Uh, or maybe other people have gone, but they've ended up in the dark and had to turn around and come back. And so I've tried to figure out how to represent that notion. And um, I thought and I thought and I thought, and I just so happened to be reading um, Plato. and. Um, and the way he works a logical argument in his dialogues and stuff. And one of the things I like is in, in the Socratic method is that you, you, you try to lead to a contradiction. Someone states a proposition, and, um, and then you show, well, let's, let's work out that proposition. Let's work out that assumption and see where it goes. And then you, you end up in a place where it's obviously wrong. So that means that you know, it's a reducio ad absurdum. We have to start off with some different uh, starting point. Well, what I did is I was thinking about, okay, why is it that to be highly creative, you have to go someplace where you don't know what you're doing? 
And I thought about it. And then all of a sudden, it dawned on me that it followed automatically from a definition of creativity that I had been working on. Uh, most people define creativity using just two criteria. And I realized that, realized we needed three. And then when I started thinking about that third criterion and translated it into mathematics, it meant that there had to be an inverse relationship between how much you used expertise and how creative the result was. And actually, it turns out this is nothing new. Um, you know, it, it turns out, I realized uh, after the fact, sometimes you end up reinventing the wheel. Um, that's actually the uh, definition, definition used by the, the U.S. Patent Office. Uh, you, you, it's not enough to produce something original, and it's not enough to produce something that's useful. You have to produce something that is not just an extension of an already established um, expertise. Uh, and um, if, if it's very clear, that's what's one of the things that a patent uh, examiner is looking at. Would someone who's a regular expert in that area be able to come up with the same idea? And if so, then you don't get your patent approved. So that was a case where I, I had this vague idea in my head, and I could sort of visualize, I had this image of actually going into the dark. You know, we have this metaphor, you know, going into the dark. Um, I had this imagery of, of, of going into the dark and, and seeing how far you could go in, until you maybe have gone too far. Because sometimes you can go into the dark to a point where um, uh, you're not going to find anything. You're, you're, you're going into the wrong cave. Like Einstein did when he tried to work on his unified field theory. He went into the wrong cave. And, um, and also, you need a little bit of expertise sometimes. So it's not totally out of the blue. So you can communicate to people. You can write up a patent uh, application. You can uh, write it up as a journal article. You can send it off as a poem to a literary journal or whatever it happens to be. So it's not like it's an either or thing. But you, the, the further you can go into your ignorance, um, the higher the probability you're going to come up with something really creative. And that is one reason why Serendipity is so important because literally serendipity means that you discover something you weren't even looking for. It, it literally comes out of the blue. Uh, and so it involves no use of expertise at all. Expertise, expertise may be involved in recognizing uh, that uh, you discovered something. So when Alexander Fleming uh, saw that all of his petri dishes with his bacteria cultures had been ruined by this uh, mold, um, he had the expertise to notice, how does this mold kill off the bacteria? And then he looked and he noticed that there's a clear area around the mold that was um, killing off the bacteria in the bacteria culture. And um, and that meant that this mold must be secreting some toxin, and um, and so then he investigated what that toxin might be, uh, the antibacterial agent, and of course that's how he got penicillin. So he had to have expertise to know once he had a serendipitous discovery how to follow it up, but it was still something that came totally out of the blue. But to get back to your original question, the main point is that that was was an example where I was trying to visualize what does it mean to, to go into the dark, to go into where you're ignorant, to come up with a creative idea, and then end up with a mathematical formula that logically shows that creativity is inversely re uh, related to sightedness. That's the, that's the opposite of, of, of blindness, the opposite of darkness. And um, so the more sighted, which means the more expertise driven you're thinking, the less likely is you're going to come up with an idea. And that's why it's creative. And that's, of course, why you have these incubation periods. This is why you take you know this walk pacing in the, in the garden. This is why I go for a walk or a bike ride. It's because you're going someplace that doesn't involve expertise. It involves exploring areas of your mind 
where you have some hidden secret that you don't know about. Yeah, one one of the best ways for me to do that is uh is long swims, and I don't know just the monotony of, of staring at the bottom of the pool. You brought up a second ago where these these ideas of genius basically just come out of nowhere. That light bulb moment is that the same as homo spatial thinking? Homo spatial thinking is a kind of um, creative thing. In fact, I should say something since you brought up homo spatial and and there's Janusian thinking um, and a whole bunch of different kinds of thinking. Creative researchers, uh, or I should say creativity researchers, although we like to think that most creativity researchers are also creative researchers, uh, have come up with a huge list of um, creative thought processes and procedures that are used by artists and inventors and scientists and so forth. Uh, Homo spatial thinking happens to be one of them where you can visualize in your mind um, two things simultaneously, two spaces basically converged into into one. Um, I already gave an example of Albert Einstein doing that. He he was really good at using homeospatial thinking. Uh, you're, you're, You're in a box that's simultaneously either on the ground or out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of outer space. Okay, that's homospatial thinking. Uh, and and uh, But let me just say this. Every single one of those creative processes that um, have been identified work some of the time. None of them work all of the time. In fact, a huge part of being creative involves the cognitive flexibility to not commit yourself to using one particular technique that you first try solving a problem, maybe you, a favorite technique, maybe it's homospatial thinking, maybe it's Genusian thinking, whatever. Um, but if it doesn't work, then you have to move on to something else. Uh, maybe it's just going to be daydreaming. Uh, you know, who knows what it's going to be? But you, you have to constantly be willing to give up on a particular approach and try something new. And that gets back to serendipity because a lot of times you don't know where it's going to come from. You know, the classic example in in, uh, in the history of science is Archimedes. And he's given this uh, problem by the king of Syracuse about whether or not he was cheated when he had uh, a goldsmith make a crown for him, whether he uh, substituted some silver in there and some of the gold for himself and archimedes you know was a great inventor and a great mathematician and he worked on that problem all sorts of different ways using every technique he had available and couldn't come up with a solution at all until he finally realized that he was overdue for a bath and soon as he got into the bathtub he noticed that he displaced the amount of water equal to the volume of the body that was in the bathtub and then all of a sudden he realized that he could use that technique to estimate the uh, volume of the crown and then figure out whether or not that corresponded to the volume of gold that was equal to the weight of the crown. And as you probably know, the story didn't have a happy ending. Uh, the poor goldsmith had his head chopped off. <laughs> but the point is, is that Archimedes, for all his problem-solving ability, he he had to wait till he was overdue for a bath uh, in order to get the solution because you, you don't know what is going to be the key to to solving a problem that's really, really novel, that's a really, really original. And um, so the point is, is that you have to be flexible enough to use first one thing, another thing, have a huge repertoire of different approaches and even non-approaches like just going for a swim or going for a jog or going for a walk and just allowing your mind to wander. And it's not just wandering. You never know. Um, I mean, I I don't think uh, pools are that stimulating because like you said, it's pretty boring looking at the bottom of a swimming pool. Uh, There's not much there. Um, But when you go for a walk, when you go for a hike, you know, a lot of – People do that. They, they'll go for a hike whenever they uh, reach some kind of obstacle. Uh, I mentioned uh, 
uh, Einstein going for a boat ride, a uh, sailboat. Uh, you never know what stimulus might be out there in your environment. It may not even be something that you notice. It might be some sound, or maybe you you overhear a word or some other thing, and it starts, we have this process we talk about in psychology, priming. Uh, that, that stimulus prime, and you can have subliminal primes, uh, it primes a chain of associations in your mind that eventually leads to a solution. Now, sometimes you'll actually, in going for a walk, you'll, you, you, you will know what the stimulus is. Uh, it's, uh, you may know the story about how Velcro was discovered. A guy was going for a hike. I think he was actually taking his dog for a walk, if I remember correctly. And there was a, um, a burr that um, got caught in his corduroy uh, pants. You know, and corduroy has these little loops in it. Okay. And so he looked at, he took one of these uh, things home with him and he looked under a microscope and he found that these had hooks on them. And of course, they have hooks on them because they're designed to catch on the fur of animals that walk by. So it will spread the seeds. So uh, that was a case where he went for a walk and he actually became aware of the stimulus and studied the stimulus. But a lot of times you're not. You, you'll never know. You just, you just come home and all of a sudden you realize you got an idea. And, uh, and you start working on it. But that idea may have come from something you saw in the corner of the eye, something you heard in the background, uh, maybe even a smell that you picked up on that launches a chain of associations that, that, that primes the associations that leads to the key to uh, this, the problem you're trying to solve. I was going to ask you a question about setting up your environment, but it, it seems like you just provided the greatest answer possible there in, in terms of getting these different stimuli, getting out, exploring new things, because you never know where that next idea is going to come from. Yeah. So so one thing I'm interested in, and we, we've talked a lot about Einstein, and you mentioned his love for the violin, and also he'll get out on the sailboat. Mm -hmm. So how much of a factor is what Malcolm Gladwell talked about with, with the 10,000 hours. And I know you've done the, the research in, in the 10 year rule. How, right. how important is that amount of deliberate practice, but then also getting in these other stimuli? Okay. That's a very good question. Um, let me first start with the, the observation that the 10 year rule um, was originally a, uh, the original research on the tenure rule uh, focused on various talent domains, like uh, playing the piano or um, various kinds of sports. And that's where they came up with this idea that um, you really can't have world-class performance, uh, you know, be able to compete in the Olympics or compete in various piano competitions or whatever, uh, until you you have about ten years of what's called deliberate practice, you know you 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 study very very hard. Um, you know, like in chess, you study the various manuals on uh, various opening tactics and mid games and so forth. Um, and then it was later on, kind of extrapolated to um, to areas of creativity. Um, and the idea that, uh, you know, as Gladwell, he, I, Gladwell converted, I think, to 10,000 hours, but it still works out to be uh, the 10-year rule. Um, the problem is this. It's not a rule. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it's an average, okay? And one of the primary things we learn as psychology is there's always a variation around the mean, Okay. And what really was troublesome for me is the early research that um, extended this to creative genius uh, just focused on the mean and didn't focus on the, on the variation. And the variation is huge. And, um, and it's huge in multiple ways. Um, first of all, I'll mention two ways that it's very important. Um, those people who end up being the greatest creative geniuses start the process of accumulating their domain specific, uh, domain specific expertise at, at younger ages. So they, they start sooner. They also, um, take less time 
Uh, they take less than 10 years. Uh, there, there are composers who are already composing uh, great works after three years of composition. Uh, Mendelssohn was a, was, a, was a good example. Uh, and, and Mozart, too. And, you know, so you have these um, child prodigies who are already at adult levels in their uh, competence in a domain when they're little kids. And um, that, that shouldn't be, you know. <laughs> you know, that, that they're not even 10 years old yet. And they're they're already they already have adult level competence. In fact, it's very interesting. A lot of people don't know this, but the first scientific study of a child prodigy was actually conducted on Mozart when he was a little kid, uh, and he was visiting London to do a concert tour. And a member of the Royal Society of London, one of the top scientific organizations, uh, just asked if he could do some studies of Mozart. Uh, he, uh, Mozart, because he was too little to travel on his own, was traveling with his dad. And he was absolutely blown away. He gave him all these tasks to do, like sight reading, you know, a, a, a piece of music that hadn't been seen before. And he was just absolutely blown away. Uh, and he actually had got access to the birth certificate to show that the father, Leopold, wasn't lying about Wolfgang's age. Uh, and just to show you the difference, his father was a a professional musician. Leopold was a professional musician. He actually wrote a book on how to play the violin. He was no slouch. And of course, he, he taught his, his, young, his young son, as well as his, his daughter, Nanarol, uh, on how to play and how to compose and whatever. And they did some duets together, sight reading. And Leopold would be making all these mistakes. Why Mozart, little Mozart, is playing away and giving his dad dirty looks. <laughs> so the point is, is that the 10 rule, 10 year rule is an average. There are people who take a lot less than that. And those are the ones who tend to become creative geniuses. They start early and take less time. And then there's those, of course, this is the dark side of the 10 year rule who um, 10 years is not going to do it, 20 years is not going to do it. <laughs> They're never going to make it. It's like what I mentioned earlier. I, I finally reached a point that I knew I wasn't going to become a good guitarist. You know, <laughs> I, I just wasn't going to make it. I, I, I would try all the fingerings and practice them and over, over and over again and, and, you know, certain complex chord progressions and things like that. And I just wasn't hitting the notes. I mean, it wasn't even it wasn't even a matter of getting the right interpretation and all that. I wasn't I wasn't always hitting the notes right, you know. So um, th th there's some people who are going to take a lot longer than ten years, and those be those better be people who recognize that they're taking too long and find something that they can do in ten years or less. And of course, that sometimes happens. You know, you have a late bloomer who finally finds the right thing for them. So the ultimate thing I start doing research on is the relationship between uh, creative genius and this 10-year rule and, and showing that there are these people who start early and they end early and, and already are at adult levels. Now, that leads me to then the question, does that prove? Because remember, this 10-year this rule was originally used to argue against talent. Nobody has any talent. The problem with a 10-year rule is that it doesn't account for the variation, the huge variation uh, in how long it takes people to establish world-class expertise in a domain uh, and how soon they begin. And I, by the way, and I should also point out that um, recent research shows that the same principle applies to the original areas of achievement where the the tenure rule originally uh, originated, uh, it, it turns out, for example, in chess, that there are kids who are already playing at adult levels well before they're ten years old. So how can the tenure rule apply if a young kid who's not even ten years old is at adult, you know, grandmaster level? It's just it, it just doesn't make any sense. 
And, uh, and the same thing is true of, of sports. There are athletes who are, now of course sports is a little bit different because you have a problem with um, physical development. Uh, so obviously you're not gonna have a Pop Warner football but player um, join the NFL. But uh, still, in terms of de- developing certain basic skills, you know, like in tennis or golf, putting, for example, um, there are people who are extremely precocious in the acquisition of a particular expertise. And they are, tend to be the ones who are more successful in the end. Although some do burn out, you do have uh, child prodigies who don't grow up to become, um, you know, creative adults or, um, you know, great athletes or whatever. But, uh, you know, it, the, the main thing is, is that um, the 10 year rule is not a rule. It's, it's an average with huge variation around. And that variation isn't noise. That variation has predictive value. No, that's a great, a great answer, response, and encapsulation of that. Because so many people, I think, just hear about the 10,000 hours. So thank you for adding some clarity there. Your years of research across some of the most impressive people throughout history, I, I know you're not going to like this question. You don't like favorites, things of that nature. But if there was one creative genius, who would it be? Someone who I'd have a conversation with? or If you're viewing, if there's a hierarchy, who's at, who's at the top of the most impressive creative genius throughout history? Oh, gee, that's so hard. Uh, first of all, it would, it, I tend to have a, um, a bias towards polymaths. Uh, and so that somewhat limits the pool. Uh, I happen to have a T-shirt on that has uh, Goethe on it because he was obviously not only a great uh, poet and a great novelist and a great dramatist, but he also was a reasonably great scientist. Uh, but I wouldn't pick him. I, I, I really have a partiality towards, and this is almost going to sound uh, trivial, but I really have a very strong uh, partiality towards Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, I just think his mind, his curiosity was so phenomenal, and yet it also combined with a tremendous artistic ability. You know, he, he was unmatched. He, the only competition he had was uh, his younger contemporary, Michelangelo. And um, so he had, he had expertise, but he had this uh, openness to experience plus, you know, where if there was anything in nature, he was curious about it and he was going to make drawings about it. Even things, you know, like um, dead people and, um, and, and wounds and, um, you know, skeletal scru- structures and muscular structures. And, or, and, but at the same time, meteorology, you know, looking at cloud formations, looking at rock formations. Uh, of course, in all of his mechanical um, inventions, uh, most of it, which probably wouldn't wouldn't have worked either. He, he had a flying machine as well that uh, you know on, that operated on the corkscrew uh, principle. But uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci is just unmatched. I actually once tried to do a study. I, like I said, I sometimes do studies focused on particular people, like you know Edison and, and Galileo and Napoleon and a Beethoven. And I, I once tried to do a study on, on just uh, Leonardo da Vinci. I wanted to go through all of his notebooks and, and all of his artwork. Of course, you know, he, there's very few artworks that he actually completed. Um, and then I found out there was a fundamental problem is that most of the stuff is undateable. And, and so I wanted to, you know, look at how he changed across time and look at the, I wanted to look at the interaction between what he was doing and like science and what he was doing in art, you know, was, was it any kind of positive synergy between those? But I, I couldn't do the study because, like I said, most of his stuff is just not datable. Um, and uh, particularly the stuff in his notebooks. Uh, he just kind of, he just kind of randomly drew things in, in there willy-nilly. And of course, some of the pages got separated and then reassembled uh, over the centuries and, and things like that. But if I had to pick one person, he would probably uh, be Leonardo da Vinci. And, you know, plus being able to write backwards or, you know, mere image with his left hand or right hand. With the left of the hand, he used, I know he wrote with both hands. He was ambidextrous. 
And I can't remember which hand he used to write backwards with, but... I think we both have the the same answer there. And Walter Isaacson, who we mentioned earlier, wrote a great biography on on Leonardo. And you mentioned his notebooks. And if, if money wasn't a thing, that's the the one thing in this world I'd love to have is one of Leonardo's notebook. And I think it was Bill Gates who who purchased one a few years ago for I think a cool fifty million or something around there. <laughs> Isn't it nice to have money? Right. <laughs> well, let's turn this conversation back to you. And I want to circle back to that phrase, it broadens me. And and you've had just such a remarkable life, so many adventures, so many different things you've taken part in. When you're looking back, what do you think has really broadened you the most? Well, I mean, clearly I had a good start. Because if you browse through the encyclopedias as a little kid, for recreation, you're going to develop a very broad, uh, very broad interest. Uh, I was interested in uh, uh, science, art, literature, philosophy, uh, in politics, uh, in the history of war. Uh, it, it, was, it was tremendously broad an experience, and and if you look at my research. You can you can see the manifestation of that. I've done research on almost every major area of achievement you can imagine. There's a few there's a few blind spots, um, and part of that is because I couldn't find the, the data. Like I said with Leonardo da Vinci, um, sometimes you just can't find the data you want. But um, I've studied scientists, philosophers, uh, creative writers, uh, composers, artists. Uh, I've studied um, presidents of the United States, lots of studies on presidents of the United States, a whole book on the presidents of the United States. Uh, I've studied uh, military generals, admirals. Um, I've studied um, uh, prime ministers. I've studied kings, queens, and sultans, of all things, the uh, the uh, sultans of the Ottoman Empire. Um, so that, that breadth of knowledge, that curiosity ends up being um, focused on you know this subject or that subject or the other subject, but they're all interrelated because they're all different forms of of genius. They're all examples of where people have had a, a unique and enduring impact on a given area uh, of civilization, a uh, history of a given domain, and um, and that breadth of interest of of course, expanded. Um, I already mentioned that I purchased the great books of the Western world, and that allowed me to learn firsthand what these scientists and these philosophers and, and writers were saying. But another thing I purchased with my hard-earned money uh, at a minimum wage job, uh, by this time I was working as a busboy instead of at a car wash, is um, what are called university prints. They don't have them anymore. Uh, except uh, you can get them at uh, like used bookstores and stuff. Um, but uh, it, it was a, a company in um, Boston area that made art prints for all the art of the world. Uh, some of them were, or actually most of them, I would say about three fourths of them were black and white prints, and the rest of them were uh, color, the minority of them were color. And it covered all the art of the world from uh, East Asia to Africa uh, to um, Mesoamerica uh, and, of course, uh, Europe. Uh, and, you know, obviously it was, you know, Eurocentric. And most of the prints had to do with Western artists and architects and, and whatever. But what I used to do, just like I would do that reading program for the great books, is, and they came in these little packages. So this is Giotto's art, for example, or Michelangelo. Michelangelo would be a lot thicker. And I would, I would take one of those packets and I'd flip through it, you know, looking at some of the art. And um, some of it was more interesting, particularly the, obviously the color was more interesting than the black and white prints. But um, that would broaden me too. And so when I would travel, I would always love if I could, uh, you know, had the time when I would travel and there was a great art museum, I'd love to go to the art museum to see the real thing. Because it's always a real kick, particularly if you're talking about sculpture, you know, to see it in the round, to walk around 
you know, uh, you know, Michelangelo's David or something. And um, so uh, that was also a broadening experience. And I, uh, I actually did my own art. I actually did a pastel that ended up in the principal's office, not because I was a bad person, but because he liked it. And um, so I, always, and I played, like I said, I played the guitar, not, not very well, but at least I learned some music. So I always had a very broad curiosity and um, I have always uh, nourished it. And um, now it's even more possible because one of the things that really allows you to broaden your, your mind is the internet. It's, it, 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 I just fall in love with it because you, I'm the kind of person I'll go, I'll look up something and um, like, for example, I may be listening to a piece of music and it's by a composer I'm, un, I'm unfamiliar with. And so I'll, I'll Google it and it will take me to a page. And then I'll, I'll, as I read that page, on, you know, like Wiki, Wiki link, uh, it will take uh, uh, um, Wikipedia and I'll find a link to something and I'll end up exploring all these different areas. I'll, I'll end up in, in architecture or the history of um, you know, some country that no longer exists or, or whatever. And I and you know all of a sudden there was an hour and a half that got went by when I finally decided you know I'm really wasting my time here. <laughs> I could do this forever. You just follow your curiosity, um, and uh, so the, the internet is just really really phenomenal. Well, unfortunately, I, I could continue this conversation for hours. This has truly been fascinating for me. You've really brought in my view my perspective, my thoughts on a lot of different topics that we covered here. But we we need to end at one place, and that has to be wine. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. So please, I would love to hear about a few of your favorite bottles of wine. Oh, gee, that's that's a hard question to answer. If you read my website, you, say, I, I, you know that even though I love uh, wine, um, you know, both reds and whites and even rosés, uh, I, uh, I, I don't have a really good um, olfactory sense, you know. I actually, you know, I study it. When you belong to a wine club, they'll tell you, okay, you'll, you'll smell uh, some, some, you know, zest of lemon and you'll know, smell, oh, I like this, you'll smell some stone, you know. Uh, and, uh, and of course, after the aroma, you also have the taste and the aftertaste, you know, on your palate and all this kind of stuff. And half of that I can't get. You know, I try and I try and I try. Uh, I love Merlots. Uh, I love, um, it's called Fumé Blanc. Uh, that's what the Mandavis called it. You know, Mandavis are really big up in this area. Uh, and in fact, the Mandavis um, donated some major buildings here on campus, including, of course, the wine school. Um, but I like Fumé Blancs. Uh, it's uh, basically a Sauvignon Blanc with lots of... Um, wood, uh, oak. And um, so those are Merlot. And, and, but then, of course, you know, the thing with wine, it depends on what you're eating with it. So uh, one wine is really good if you're, you know, just having cheese and crackers and grapes and, uh, and then a totally different one if you're having a, a steak or whatever. But I want to say one thing about wine that I really, really love. And I was really passionate about and I'm still passionate about. And that is, you talk about breadth of interest. If you really, really study wine, if you really are a wine lover, you have to study geography, you have to study language, you have to study chemistry, you have to study history, and of course you have to develop some degree of, um, you know, taste, sense of taste and, and sense of smell. Uh, you have to develop a uh, interest in zines, uh, and um, so. Just loving wine forces you, if you're a real wine lover, to be interested in a lot of different things. I, I used to be a chemistry major, and I just love learning about, you know, various kinds of ways that, you know, wine is prepared, you know, and, and in order to get this effect or that effect or whatever. Yes, wine, wine is a, a true passion of mine. I just got back some from some wine tasting out in your neck of the woods, and if you're looking for a great Sauvignon Blanc, I got to try the uh, the hourglass, the 16. It was out of the barrel. They were just about to bottle it. So if, if you make your way out there, I recommend that. 
barrel, barrel tasting is so fun. I, I love barrel tasting. You're, that, that's when you really, really feel the experience of winemaking. I, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's a truly fascinating experience if you get the opportunity to have that. But your work has had a, a large impact on me. I look forward to continuing these conversations and, and finding out more about your research and your work. So is there anything in the pipeline the listener should be aware of? Anything they should go pick up right now? Oh, definitely. They have to buy. MIT Press just came out with uh, the, the Genius Checklist. Nine paradoxical tips on how you can become a creative genius. And it has nine tips that you can check off and find out whether or not you are, in fact, a creative genius. If you're not a creative genius yet, it'll tell you what you need to do. And uh, it's now being translated into Japanese and Chinese. So if you are uh, fluent in one of those languages, you can read it in September. Fantastic. Well, we'll definitely have that linked up in the show notes along with your website and other books as well. But I can't thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. Okay. Thank you very much. This was fun. Hey, guys, I want to tell you about the brand I'm obsessed with right now. And you guys know I'm pretty obsessive about the brands I work with, especially when it comes to athletic apparel. You guys need to check out 10,000. You need to head to 10,000.cc and you guys can enter code WGYT and you're going to receive 20%, yes, 20% off your entire order. Why do I love 10,000? 10,000 created the only training shorts you'll ever need. They do so by simplifying your options to deliver three premium shorts that perfectly cover all the ways you train. They have one built for versatility, another for durability, and one super lightweight, perfect for one of those runs or whatever else you do for fitness. No matter what you do, they have you covered. CrossFit, running, spin, yoga, lifting, or your weekend adventure, it doesn't matter what you do for fitness. They have a short for every way you train. They make it super simple too to find the right short. Just pick the short that's best for you, your lifestyle, personalize it with your individual needs with a custom liner and inseam options, and start getting after it. Not sure if they have the right short? No need to worry, you guys. Make a return or exchange. They offer free shipping, free exchanges, and free returns on every order. Like I said, 10,000 is my favorite brand right now. I am wearing their apparel all the time when I'm working out. I can't recommend them enough. Head to 10,000.cc, enter code WGYT, and you've got 20% off your entire order. You guys know how much I love travel. So I think you're really going to like this next brand. That brand is Globekick. Head to globekick.com, check out what they've got going on, and you can also enter code WGYT to receive 10% off. Globekick makes your travel dreams a reality. They make it easy to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable adventures. And you're wondering what some of those adventures are? How about a yoga retreat in Italy? Cage diving with great whites in South Africa? Or their most recent trip was dog sledding and chasing the Northern Lights. Yes, they saw the Northern Lights. I think you guys would love checking them out. So head to globekick.com, enter code WGYT, and you've got 10% off. What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with got you, got you? Thanks for listening to another episode of What Got You There. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and also share with your friends. Thanks so much. Looking forward to talking with you next time. If you want to stay up to date on all things I'm working on behind the scenes and everything we've got going on at What Got You There, head over to whatgotyouthere.com. You'll also be able to see more on podcast guests and what they're doing. Thanks to Justin Great for providing us the intro and outro song. If you like his music and want to find out more about what he's working on, head over to justingreat.com.